What's your favorite alien? Is it a friendly one, like E.T. or Mr. Spock or Yoda? Or Baby Yoda? I know his name is Grogu, but it just doesn't really catch on for me. <laughs> or is it a um, not-so-friendly one, like Jabba the Hutt or Thanos? Or these guys from Mars Attacks? Or the alien from Alien? Either way, there's plenty of aliens to choose from. Humans are excited and almost a little obsessed about the idea of extraterrestrial life. Life that originated on a celestial body that is not our home planet Earth. There's numerous books, comics, movies and video games that feature aliens in some way. UFO conspiracies are some of the most popular ones around, and the name Area 51 speaks to many people's imagination. Why are we so captivated by the idea of aliens? We love dragons and orcs and unicorns as well, but aliens tickle our imagination more than any other fictional being. Well, there's the fact that scientists are actively looking for alien life forms. People that dedicate their lives to finding out the true nature of our universe seem overwhelmingly convinced it's worth putting time and energy into the search for extraterrestrials. So aliens feel more real, like it's a discovery that's just waiting to happen. That any day now, a spaceship will land and they will come say hello. Or murder us all. But how did we, as an intelligent self-aware species, come up with the idea of beings from other worlds? And why do we look for them? Let's dive into some history. Before the invention of the telescope, humans could only guess what the true nature of the stars and planets was. That's not to say nobody believed in the existence of other worlds outside of our own, but it was more in a mythological and philosophical sense. And so the question was not, do other solar systems and other planets and other living beings exist and could we contact them? But it was more like, is the universe infinite, and if so, do other worlds and people exist? The belief in the existence of multiple worlds beyond our own is called cosmic pluralism. The earliest recorded mentions that allude to extraterrestrial life come from Jainism, an ancient Indian religion. According to Jainism, the universe consists of many worlds or realms of existence that support human life. In the 6th century BC in ancient Greece, the philosopher Anaximander was the first to speculate about the possibility of multiple worlds in a scientific sense. Later, philosophers like Democritus and Epicurus believed that there were many worlds beyond our own, and even Alexander the Great is said to have subscribed to this idea. Not because he thought it was cool, but because he was bummed out by the idea of conquering other worlds while he had yet to conquer just one. <laughs> Conceded. <laughs> On the other side of this philosophical debate, there were prominent thinkers like Plato and Aristotle, who firmly believed our world is unique and that there can be no other worlds. Their rhetoric became a more popular one, and so the Western world and Christianity adopted this idea and it remained dominant for centuries. Muslim scholars, on the other hand, embraced cosmic pluralism, citing the Quran to support their argument. One verse reads, God has created other things of which he have no knowledge. In Arabic literature, a tale from 1001 Nights, The Adventures of Bulakia, depicts a universe with different worlds, some bigger than Earth, and each with their own inhabitants. The protagonist, Bulakia, embarks on a quest to search for the herb of eternal life, and travels the seas, goes to paradise and hell, and into the cosmos to visit other worlds. You could consider this an early onset to galactic science fiction. Back in the West, in the 16th century, a revolution was brewing. In 1543, Polish scientist Nicolaus Copernicus published a book in which he proposed a heliocentric model of the universe. He placed the sun at the center of the cosmos instead of the earth. Geocentrism, with earth at the center and everything revolving around it, was a commonly held belief at the time, so Copernicus's book kicked off major changes in science for centuries to come. Galileo Galilei was a defender of heliocentrism and cosmic pluralism, based on his astronomical observations with telescopes of his own design. But the Catholic Church accused him of heresy, claiming multitudes of worlds and Earth not being the center of the universe went against Holy Scripture. Galileo was never tried for heresy, but the contemporary friar and philosopher Giordano Bruno was. He is remembered for his outspoken support of cosmic pluralism, and he argued the stars were distant suns surrounded by their own planets, and that those worlds may host life. Bruno had a bad habit of pissing the Catholic Church off with his radical ideas of other suns, an infinite universe, pantheism and reincarnation. In the year 1600, he was burned at the stake. But the scientific revolution couldn't be stopped, and cosmic pluralism became more and more widespread. 
French writer Cyrano de Bergerac wrote about a society living on the moon as a parody of earthly society. English poet Sir Richard Blackmore wrote in his work, We may pronounce each orb sustains a race of living things adapted to the place. And he suggested, our world's sun becomes a star elsewhere. By the 18th century, the belief in the possibility of extraterrestrial life was becoming mainstream. And prominent scholars of the time championed the idea, including philosophers like John Locke and Immanuel Kant, and even politicians like John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. English astronomer and composer William Herschel, the man that discovered the planet Uranus, firmly believed in cosmic pluralism and was sure he had found evidence of life on the moon. He theorized all the other planets were populated and went as far as speculating the interior of the sun was inhabited. That seems pretty bonkers, but at the time the commonly held belief of the origin of life was spontaneous generation. The idea that life basically popped up out of nowhere. And so it was generally assumed life could thrive anywhere. This theory was disproved at the end of the 19th century. But that didn't stop people from believing in alien civilizations. Science fiction writers like Jules Verne and Nicolas Camille Flammarion helped popularize the idea of life on other worlds. And Flammarion was one of the first people to put forward the idea that extraterrestrial beings were genuinely alien and not simply variations of life on Earth. In the late 19th century, speculation of life on Mars would reach its peak, following telescopic observations of features on the planet that seemed to resemble canals. However, these turned out to be optical illusions. You see, it was the late 1800s and photography wasn't used yet to make astronomical observations. Astronomers had to sit and stare for hours through their telescopes, waiting for a moment of still air so the image would be clear, and then draw a picture of what they saw. So you can imagine not everybody's observations were 100% reliable. Despite this, American astronomer Percival Lowell firmly believed the canals were real and remnants of an ancient civilization, and he published three books on the subject. Other scientists were skeptical, and Mars would turn out to be hostile to complex life, and there were no obvious remnants of life ever having been there in the first place. Lowell's ideas did inspire British writer H.G. Wells to write the story The War of the Worlds, in which aliens from Mars come to invade Earth after their own world becomes uninhabitable. The 20th century saw many huge developments in science and another big surge in the popularity of aliens among the general public. People started to believe UFOs could be alien visitors. UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object and refers to anything a person sees flying across the sky but can't tell what it is. UFO sightings are basically as old as humanity and the term in and of itself has nothing to do with aliens. They could be any kind of aircraft, satellites, weather balloons, lightning, aurora, meteors, comets, atmospheric optical phenomena like sundogs, or just birds. During the Second World War, pilots reported seeing so-called Foo Fighters. No, not the band, but glowing fireballs in the sky. Some explanations at the time included static electricity, the planet Venus, hallucinations, or German secret weapons. The popular UFO craze began with the media frenzy surrounding reports on June 24, 1947, by civilian pilot Kenneth Arnold. He claimed he had seen nine objects flying, like rocks skipping over water, near Mount Rainier in the USA, leading to newspaper articles of flying disks and flying saucers. UFO sightings skyrocketed, and by 1953, US intelligence got worried that actual reports of enemy aircraft could get lost in the noise created by the overwhelming amount of false accounts. In 1966, a TV special called UFO, Friend, Foe or Fantasy was aired, hosted by Walter Cronkite, who patiently explained UFOs were unlikely to be visitors from outer space. Scientists Carl Sagan and J. Allen Hynek were on the program. Hynek said, to this time, there is no proof that I would con consider valid scientific proof that we have been visited by spaceships. You can find the whole episode on YouTube. I'll link it in the description if you want to see it for yourself. It's really fun to watch a program from the 1960s about aliens and UFOs. To this very day, there's many conspiracy theories surrounding UFOs and alien visitors. There's people claiming they have been abducted and experimented on, or even that aliens have been here since before the dawn of humankind and have helped us develop as an intelligent species. Most people don't take these conspiracies very seriously, but aliens are as popular as ever in mainstream culture and entertainment. 
Despite all of this, scientists do make serious efforts to find extraterrestrial life. And the 20th century saw many advancements in science and technology that made this possible for the first time in human history. The development of spaceflight meant that humans could visit other celestial bodies by sending probes or robots, or even going there themselves, to see whether life was there or ever had been. One other scientific development that would turn out to be important was research into extremophile bacteria, microorganisms that live in environments that are hostile to most other life forms. In 1967, American microbiologist Thomas D. Brock studied bacteria that live in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park and put question marks around the common notion that life requires moderate temperatures. Ever since, biologists have found many kinds of extremophile bacteria in sub-zero temperatures, in highly salty, basic or acidic environments, under high pressure, low humidity, and even under high radiation like ultraviolet rays or even radioactivity. What that tells us is that life could essentially happen anywhere and doesn't necessarily need Earth-like conditions. And so scientists have good hope of finding life or remnants of its presence on planets and moons in our solar system and beyond. Over the course of the decades, many promising discoveries have been made. Studies of the moon show that it may have had an atmosphere and liquid water on its surface shortly after its formation about 3.5 billion years ago, and warm and pressurized pockets in the moon's interior might still have liquid water. The spacecraft Messenger found evidence of water ice on the planet Mercury. Venus was once considered to be very similar to Earth, until observations in the 20th century revealed that Venus's surface temperature is a scorching 467 degrees Celsius and the pressure on the surface is 90 times that of Earth. The atmosphere of the planet is almost completely made up of toxic carbon dioxide. But Venus likely had liquid water on its surface as well, at least for some time after its formation. And there may be extremophile microorganisms living in Venus's atmosphere. Many probes and rovers have visited Mars, and while so far no life or traces of it have been found, there is evidence that our neighbor planet had a warmer and wetter past. There's dried up riverbeds and polar ice caps, and minerals have been found that form in the presence of water. Even present day conditions of subsurface Mars may support life. Ceres, the only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, has a thin water vapor atmosphere, and so life may also be possible there. In the Jupiter system, scientists mostly look at the Galilean moons for signs of past or present life. Europa may have a liquid water ocean beneath its icy crust. Ganymede, the biggest moon in the solar system, has a thin atmosphere in which water vapor was discovered in 2021, and it has a big saltwater ocean beneath the surface. The moon Callisto may also have a subsurface ocean. Saturn's biggest moon Titan has liquid methane on its surface, in the form of rivers, lakes and seas. Organic chemistry has been found in its thick atmosphere. And while that's not direct evidence of life, it's very promising and astrobiologists consider Titan to be the place in the solar system to look for alien life forms. Although some say that liquid water is essential for life and Titan may just have some cool chemical reactions going on, but there's no life to be found at all. NASA's Dragonfly mission is set to launch in 2027 and will reach Titan in the 2030s. Enceladus, another major moon of Saturn, may have liquid water under its icy surface, and the Cassini-Huygens probe detected key elements for supporting life, such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, during a flyby through one of Enceladus's geysers spewing ice and gas. Organic molecules have been found in meteorites on Earth that are several billion years old, and meteors crashing into Earth may have provided the necessary compounds for life to develop. So it stands to reason that this may be the case for other celestial bodies as well. It seems organic molecules are fairly abundant in the universe, so life may be as well. The discovery of the first exoplanets in 1992 is easily one of the most exciting findings in the history of astronomy. It finally confirmed what many people had been dreaming of for ages, and humanity's desire to find alien life was bigger than ever. As of January 1st, 2022, there are 4,000 905 confirmed exoplanet in 3,629 planetary systems, with 808 systems having more than one planet. Scientists focus their search for signs of extraterrestrial life on Earth-like planets in a star's habitable zone, the so-called Goldilocks zone, where temperatures allow for liquid water on a planet's surface. In 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope was launched to find such planets, until it was retired in 2018. It found 2,662 exo-Earths. 
In December of 2021, the James Webb Infrared Space Telescope was launched, and one of its purposes is to study planetary systems and possible signs of life. Life forms produce a variety of so-called biosignatures that may be detectable by telescopes. One important sign would be the presence of a lot of oxygen in the planet's atmosphere, since this can pretty much only be explained by life thriving there. Other than probes and telescopes, scientists have also been investigating signals from outer space. Projects under the umbrella of SETI, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, are monitoring the galaxy for possible messages from civilizations of other worlds, in the form of radio waves or microwaves, since these can easily travel through interstellar space. SETI has been active since the 1960s and has many projects all over the world. One branch of SETI is called SETI. Yeah, I know that's a little confusing, it stands for Communications with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they attempt to send messages to other civilized worlds. Mathematics is a preferred language to use for these messages, since math is supposed to be universally understood. There's also the Pioneer plaques attached to the Pioneer 10 and 11 space probes that were launched in 1972 and 1973. These plaques depict how to find the solar system in the galaxy and which planet is Earth, and a drawing of what human beings look like. The two Voyager probes launched in 1977 each carry a golden record with the same information and images, music, and sounds from Earth. The pioneers and voyagers have all left the solar system and are now flying through interstellar space. Who knows, somewhere in the distant future, somebody will find them and decipher messages of people that are long gone. Nowadays, the idea that humanity will one day find intelligent alien life is quite commonly accepted. But there are counter-arguments. In the year 2000, Peter Ward and Donald E. Brownlee published their book Rare Earth – Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. In this book, they argue that the exact circumstances needed for life to develop into biological complexity and eventually into an intelligent species like humans are incredibly rare. And so another civilization might not exist at the same time as us. Or ever. Another counter-argument is the massive scale of the universe. Physics tell us that the fastest anything can go at is the speed of light, about 300,000 kilometers per second. But even at the speed of light, it takes an incredibly long time to cross any significant distance in the universe. Going from Earth to the Sun at light speed would take about 8 minutes. From the Sun to Pluto, it would take 5 hours. And that doesn't seem very long, but by that point you haven't even left the solar system yet. It's like taking 5 hours to go from your kitchen to your front door. The nearest star, Proxima Centauri, sits at about 4 light years away from the Sun. So that's 4 years of traveling at light speed. Imagine taking that long to go to your neighbor's house. Another consequence of this is that anything we look at in the night sky, any star, planet or galaxy, we are looking at it in the past, because light coming from these distant objects takes many, many years to reach us. The Andromeda galaxy, our galactic neighbor, sits at about 3 million light years away. So the light we see coming from Andromeda now is 3 million years old. If astronomers see a supernova happening in Andromeda tomorrow, that light has been on its way for millions of years, and that star has long since died and is now a white dwarf or a black hole. So on the odd chance that signals from an alien civilization reach us, even from within our own Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years across, that signal would have traveled for an extremely long time, and the people that sent it might be long gone. Essentially, we're sitting on a tiny island, a speck of dust in a dark ocean so vast, nobody can truly comprehend it. We may not be alone, but we may never be able to contact whoever else is sitting on their own tiny islands, gazing up at the night sky and wondering. All we can do is throw messages in bottles and hope one washes up on their shore, but we will never know each other. And then there's the time scale of the universe to consider. Everything is far apart, and it takes many, many years to go anywhere. But it also took 4 billion years for life on Earth to develop an intelligent species that can send messages out into space. The universe itself is about 13.8 billion years old. Depending on a hypothesis, scientists estimate the universe will last for at least hundreds of trillions of years. So one could argue life on Earth may just be early. We could be one of the first intelligent species to ever arise in the universe. Which means that there's simply no alien civilizations for us to contact. Not yet. Which is a bit depressing because there's no telling how long humanity will last. Some people say that we're doomed to wipe ourselves out and that such is the fate of any intelligent species if they can't learn to control their basic instincts. 
and blindly destroy their environment and each other for short-term gains. All of that considered, there's also scientists that warn against contacting alien civilizations. If they're out there, they may be so advanced that we simply can't detect their communications with our simplistic machines. And they may have figured out the solution to the light speed problem and travel interstellar space in relatively short amounts of time using technology that seem impossible by our current understanding of physics. Physicist Stephen Hawking once said, if aliens visit us, the outcome would be much as when Columbus landed in America. Which didn't turn out well for the Native Americans. Well, that's an understatement. So basically they say humanity should keep quiet and not make warmongering and colonizing civilizations aware of our presence. All of that is downright scary to think about. We could be completely alone in the darkness, and if we are not alone, we could be too far away from anyone in time and space. Or we could be in danger. So why do we look for aliens? Humans have always been curious and love to explore, so I suppose we just can't help ourselves. We look for aliens simply because we can. We boldly go where no one has gone before because we can't stand the idea of not knowing what could be out there. It might turn out to be underwhelming or nothing at all, or it could blow up in our faces, but at least then we will know. And what we find could be completely amazing and even helpful for our species. Humans throughout the millennia have battled the elements and went against all odds just to find out what was out there. What new things could be discovered? New horizons, new planets and suns and galaxies. The very nature of our universe and ourselves. We have barely scratched the surface. There is always more to know. And I guess that makes it all worth it. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new because I sure did. And you can always learn something new. I will see you next time. Bye.